Cigar box guitars have become popular in the last few years. They're cheap and easy to make because there are no rules on how they're to be made. Pretty much anything goes. I've made cigar box guitars before, but this is the first of several ukuleles that I'm currently working on. Hi, I'm Paul. This is openwoodshop.com and today I want to show you how I made this cigar box ukulele. At the beginning of this video you saw a guitar I made using a cigar box from the 1940s. It was broken and needed a lot of repair, but I really liked it a lot, so since then I've made my own cigar boxes patterned after it. The wood I'm using is some sort of mahogany or mahogany-ish wood. It was actually a forklift sticker that was given to me. And there's every chance that because this is a first attempt at this build that it could be a big fat failure. So using this free wood, which actually looks pretty nice, makes more sense than wasting a nice piece of expensive exotic wood. Although this is just a humble cigar box ukulele, I'm taking the opportunity to build some luthier skills. And this is a good opportunity to learn something about inlays, which I haven't done a lot of, so I'm making some veneers for that. I've made other videos of the tools and jigs that I've made, and I'll put links below for anyone who's interested. The jig here holds the belt sander and allows me to make paper-thin veneers. By soaking the oak veneers I made in water and steel wool for about a week, they will ebonize. This is going to be for some inlays. Real ebony can be expensive, so I'm kind of stingy where I use it. As I mentioned before, the wood that I'm using comes from a forklift sticker, so it's not wide enough to make a one-piece or even a two-piece back, so a three-piece back is what it will be. In doing this project, I've learned a lot, so when I look back on this video uh, when it was shot, I think I would do some things a little different, but in the end, it turned out okay, so I guess it's all good. Despite the mishaps and the missteps, I finally got the back together and glued in and shaped the spruce braces. And where the back was glued together, I routed out grooves and inlaid the veneer that I was making earlier. I sandwiched a strip of maple veneer between two black pieces and it really dressed things up. And gluing the back onto the box though will come later. Joining the neck and the body together is a crucial step that requires a fair amount of precision. I made a jig that I found plans for on Stumac's website that makes it possible to make the mortise and tenon joint and of course I made a video of the whole process of which I will leave a link below. I didn't shoot any video while using it on this ukulele but I did for another uke that I'm still in the process of making so I'm using that video here for demonstration purposes. It took some tweaking and practice to get it just right, but in the future, this jig will make accurate mortises fast and easy, and I'll be able to use it for other types of joints such as dovetail mortises, and even for other perhaps non-musical related projects. Clamping a neck so that it can be shaped can be a challenge, especially when the neck is very short. So I came up with a way that seems to work pretty well for me, and yes, there is a short video about it that I made, and yes, there will be a link below. In this case, I'm making a bolt-on neck, so there's already a threaded insert in, and so it just bolts onto the jig very easily. But I think if you're joining it with, say, a dovetail, you might be able to use a screw, or it might even be worth it to put an insert in, and when you're all done, take it out and dowel plug it, or it probably wouldn't hurt just to leave it in. As you can see, you can turn the neck in almost any direction and clamp the jig into the vise in almost any direction. The spring clamp firms up the neck to the jig and it also takes some of the stress off from the insert, which is the only point of contact. I think there is some room for improvement in this simple jig and I'm sure I'll keep working on it for a while. And if there's any viewers out there that have any ideas, please feel free to share them in the comments below. To make the fretboard, the slots are cut, the board is tapered to shape and glued onto the neck, and then the frets are pressed or hammered in. On this slot cutting jig, another shop made tool, 
Indexing is done by cutting a slot into the bottom board of the jig and a dulled razor blade is pressed into the slot. I have a store-bought fretboard that is carefully matched up and taped to my blank. Each slot in my store-bought board fits onto the razor blade below, allowing me to make a perfectly placed cut in my blank above. The depth gauge for the cuts is simple, but it works and it's accurate. If I have fretboards that are a different width or thickness, I'll have to make another one, but who knows, I might even come up with something more advanced. After the slots are cut into the board, it's tapered and I do this on my multi-sled. It's an easy tool to make and there's a build link below for that. After checking to make sure that the board fits the neck correctly, it's time to hammer in the frets. There are plenty of tutorials on the internet on how to fret an instrument. I've done a few and never had any problems, but I'm still a beginner at this and so you probably should consult the experts. There are presses that you can buy to do this job, but for now, I'm using a brass hammer. If this hammer looks a little wonky, it's because I cobbled it together from an old hammer and a couple of brass plumbing parts. I will no doubt upgrade someday, but it works okay, and it saved me $35. There is a link below on how it's made. At this point, it's time to fit the nut and bridge. I have some Ipe ironwood that I use for both the fretboard and the bridge. The nut was made from ebony. Before the gluing the bridge down, it needs to be temporarily clamped down and positioned. And this requires the instrument to be strung up and slots cut in the saddle and nut. You pretty much have to bite the bullet and fork out the cash for the quality nut files. They run about $15 each and for this uke, I needed three files. Intonation is checked, bridge adjusted, position marked, and then it's glued down. In making my first rosette ever, I was very happy how it looked, but it was inlaid just a little too shallow into the top, so it didn't take much sanding to go right through the rosette that I was so proud of, and the more I tried to fix it, the worse things got. I finally had to cut a larger sound hole and make a different kind of rosette that I could set onto the sound hole and glue in. Live and learn. This project is a learning exercise, so I decided to dress things up and put bindings on the box. I cut my bindings from some spalted curly maple to match the rosette, the fretboard dots, and the laminations on the front and back of the headstock. The ends are mitered close to the line and then sanded to size. And by the way, the large sheet of sandpaper is for a floor sander and comes from the tool rental department at the Home Depot. It's 12 inches by 18 inches and has a very heavy backing so it lasts longer than regular sandpaper. The edges of the box were routed on the router table. I super glued the bindings into place, although type on would have been just fine. The bindings were just a little proud of the surfaces so I finished it off by sanding them down flush with the box. At last we're ready for painting and the final assembly. Mahogany has an open grain that needs to be filled. There are grain fillers, but I'm going to just use good old fashioned shellac, which will fill and seal the wood before applying the top coat. I mix my own shellac using flakes and alcohol. Mix it up and let the flakes dissolve for a while and you're good to go. And for a smoother coat, I wet sand between each coat with 320 wet or dry sandpaper. Shellac doesn't have good resistance to water though, so it will need a top coat, and for that I'm going to use polyurethane right from the rattle can. Poly is very hard to keep from running on vertical surfaces. I tried hanging in the parts, but eventually I just went to spraying only on the horizontal, one surface at a time. It's final assembly time. A lot of very fine guitar makers have gone to using the bolt-on neck. It's easy, quick, solid and there seems to be no difference in tone. The tuning pegs go on. I'm using traditional ukulele friction tuning pegs, 
They take a little getting used to, but they seem to work just fine. I put one drop of super glue on the nut and set it in place, and then I'm ready to string up. Nylon strings take uh, time to stretch and break in, so I find myself tuning up a lot in the meantime. And there we go. I'm taking a little time to learn a few chords, and I have to say that I'm having a lot more fun playing the ukulele than I thought I would. I've got several more instruments started, and as I finish I'll be putting up more videos on tips and tricks I've learned along the way. If you like this video, please subscribe, like, and definitely leave a comment in the comments section. Check out my YouTube channel and website openwoodshop.com because there are lots of other projects I'm doing in the shop and you just might find something that you'll find interesting or helpful. And thanks again for following me around the shop.